On today's show, we're going to be looking at the brand new Final Cut Pro 10 version 10.4, primarily focusing on the new color tools. Good morning and welcome to Photo Justice Photo Moment, the first live thrust weekly show here on YouTube every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9.30 a.m. Pacific, talking about all kinds of things, photo and video and live streaming related. Basically, if it's got a camera on it, it's fair game. We are looking at the new Final Cut Pro 10 version 10.4 just released yesterday, and this is an upgrade I have been gagging for, and let me tell you why. Primarily because I've made the mistake of, well, I kind of made the mistake I had to upgrade my laptop to High Sierra, not my main machine, and High Sierra and Final Cut Pro 10, 4, 10 version 10.3 dot whatever was not so happy with it. On some systems, it was, there's this huge discussion forum on Apple's forums about it. Tons of people having a really, really bad experience. Basically, Final Cut crawled to, to an unbelievably slow stutter, and you'd have to reboot the machine to get it back, and this would happen within a couple minutes of editing. So it made it virtually impossible, which is actually one of the reasons, I'm gonna use it as the entire reason, that I have not yet done the vlog edit from the trip that I did to LA and San Francisco like two months ago. That's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. But now we've got High Sierra and Final Cut Pro 10 10.4 fully compatible versions. And in so far in looking at it, it's working really nicely. Now Final Cut 10.4 has a lot of really nice new features. Let me pull up the feature list. We, we're not going to go through everything, but I'm going to talk about well, we're going to go through the list, and then we'll take a look at some of the features. For those of you who are watching live, if you have any questions, comments, commentary, and so on, you know what to do. You are part of the live show, so you get to participate in Chit Chat in here. If you've got a question or a comment directed at me, make sure you type at Photo Joseph in front of it. And of course, if you're not watching this live, you could be and you should be. You know how that works. All right, let's go into just a quick little, uh, this is the Apple page, just the... Um, what do you call it, the Apple web page talking about the new versions. And you can see version, well, what's new in 10.4? There's a lot of stuff. So 360 VR editing, this is a big deal, of which I have absolutely zero capability to play with. So we're not going to. I don't have a 360 VR camera, but apparently you cannot edit in 360. I've seen some demo stuff of it. It's pretty cool, but it's like totally not my thing. So we're just gonna skip right past that. Advanced color grading, this is where it's really exciting. So lots of stuff, dedicated color tab. Um, it basically means there's one, one click to get straight into your color controls now. New color wheels, very, very nice. We're gonna look at those color curves. Regular viewers know how much I love curves, so I'm super excited to see that in there. Hue saturation curves, incredibly cool. Uh, eyedropper in the hue and saturation curves, we'll take a look what that means. You can sample a color and manipulate it very easily. Balance color includes manual white balance. Manual white balance. Y you know, it's like 2017, it's about time we got white balance in a video editor. Right? I mean, seriously. So this is great, because this is one of those things where if you're shooting video and your white balance wasn't off, if you're shooting raw stills, well, well duh, click, done, fix, right? But in video, it was not that easy. But now it is. Yes. So we're excited about that. I don't know if I have a really good sample to show you, but I'll show the, show the feature anyway. This is another huge one. Custom LUTs. You can apply custom LUTs. Now, we're going to look at this. There's two different places to apply LUTs. And uh, we'll explain more of what they are when we get there and why you choose one over the other. But we have LUT control and this is fantastic. Super happy about that. Color corrections over time with keyframing. Let's get the right one there. Um, you can keyframe your color corrections, which is fantastic. We're not really gonna look at that today, but you can do it. Um, speed through color correction using new keyboard shortcuts of which I've not learned, so we're gonna move slowly today. Um, and then color presets now located in the effects browser. We just call it better for color presets. Let's be honest here, the color presets are not that exciting. I, I quickly looked at them. They look like the same ones. Maybe I haven't looked at them all. Maybe there's some better ones, but they're like really kind of, you know, hitch in the head, kind of big, heavy, and I really like them. But we'll take a look and see if there's anything there. It is, however, cool to have. Next up, this, I didn't even know. So I kind of knew some of the features coming, but not everything, uh, mainly because Apple had made some of this public already. But there's high dynamic range support, but here's the biggie right here, Rec 2020 HLG, hybrid log gamma. Why is that exciting? Because <laughs> that's what the GH5 shoots. That means that you can now shoot in HLG, Hybrid Log Gamma, on your GH5 and edit directly in Final Cut Pro for HDR output. I got an email this morning from a uh, kind of a press thing from uh, Atomos, and I, unfortunately I didn't have time to read it because it's been kind of a crazy morning, but I'm sure that they are confirming what I already had in my head was that I could take that Atomos Ninja Inferno, connect it to a laptop or to your iMac or whatever as an external monitor, it is a high-knit HDR monitor, so you can use that to preview 
your HDR content, to use that as your program monitor, your output monitor, to see what your HDR content actually looks like in HDR, which is really cool. So that'll be a whole separate show because I'm really excited about that, but I have to actually go out and shoot something in HDR now that I have something to do. I couldn't do anything with it before, so I was like, what's the point? So now I can, so I am very excited about that. But what else is it saying here? Output video to third-party HDR monitors. So there you go. Uh, Built-in waveform indicates HDR brightness up to 10,000 nits, which is considerably higher than even a new IMAX screen. So you'll be able to accurately gauge all of this. And that's, if you're kind of going, well, uh, well I, what, I don't get that. Look at, think of it like this. If you're editing a photo and your monitor is not particularly great, particularly color balanced, particularly accurate, particularly bright, whatever, you you may not be seeing what is the truth, right? The truth of the photo. An easy way to examine uh, to think about this is white. If you have something that is truly white, pure white, that's in RGB, that'd be 255, 255, 255, pure white. The eyedropper, the love, the histogram might tell you that's pure white, but on your screen it looks dark blue or you know pale blue because it's got a blue cast to it and it's not fully bright. If you know how to read your histogram then it doesn't matter if your screen is not color accurate because you know when you sell something to be white, white is white and you know that it's white and it doesn't matter that it doesn't look like look white, it is white. Same idea here. If you have this super bright dynamic range, super high dynamic range scene and your monitor isn't capable of displaying that, you're going, well, I, I think that's within range, but I don't really know. Having the scopes to tell you that, it's like having the histogram to tell you that is super, super important. So that is awesome that that is there. HDR tools uh, help you tone map HDR. So this is all stuff we'll have to play with another day. And option to H view HDR as raw values when converting, uh, we're working without an HDR monitor. So again, part of that monitoring to make sure that you are blasting out something that is not blasting out your, your viewers' screens. Um, other little features, we're not gonna look into these. We're really gonna focus on the color, but just to kind of run through them real quick, send your iMovie for iOS project directly to Final Cut. This is great because you may have seen before that I've gone through this where you would take, if you edited an iMovie on your iPad or your iPhone, and then you wanted to finish that on Final Cut, you had to transfer the iOS iMovie project over to your desktop, open it in iMovie for Mac OS, okay? So iMovie on iOS, open it in iMovie for Mac OS, and then from there, you could send it over to Final Cut. Obviously, stupid. But now, you have the ability to take that iOS project and open it directly in Final Cut, which is huge, very, very nice. Uh, let's see here. Important playback of HEVC, high efficiency video codec. That means if you're shooting with an iPhone well, 10, 8, possibly 7 with the iOS 11. I'm not quite sure where that started. But um, in shooting in HEVC, you can now actually edit that video. It's one of those things where you'd shoot video on your iPhone, and then you couldn't actually edit it in Final Cut. Kind of lame, but now that has been fixed. And because it's got HEVC or H.265 support, that also means that we can now edit, uh-huh, you got it, GH5. 6K photo video files because those are HEVC. And we're going to open those up here just to show that you can. It's a little chunky on my laptop. This laptop's a couple of years old, so it's not totally smooth playback, but it's there, which is fantastic. So that's cool. Um, let's see here. New uh, redesign over the Logic effects. If you're, uh, if you've been, if you've been, if you're using the Logic plugins, Logic Pro 10 plugins, those have been redesigned. I guess they're all retina now, which is kind of nice. Um, if you shoot Canon Cinema Raw light format, you have the support for that in here. This is good. Faster optical flow analysis using Metal 2. I don't know if that'll actually have any effect on this hardware or even my iMac. I, I don't know where Metal 2 really comes into play, but if you've got the hardware to support it, then um, optical flow will be supported, will be rendered out on metal too. Optical flow incidentally is what's used when you do retiming. So if you were to take a shot and slow it down, you are adding frames, you're building frames in between. Um, optical flow is very, very good. You can get excellent results from it, but it's slow. So this hopefully, ideally, is speeding things up. Support for NFS-based libraries and media, that's fantastic. So if you were doing network attached storage, um, NFS storage on a network, you can now store your stuff there and access it from Final Cut. So that is very good. And uh, XML 1.7 support. So I'm, that is gonna have to do with exporting for other color grading tools. So for new, it has support for the new color grading tools, 360 VRFX and HDR. So if you're gonna finish in DaVinci Resolve, for example, that is, I believe, where that would come into play. So that is the feature list. I am very excited. Frederick, hello. Good morning, Frederick. Frederick, my boy. It, it, incidentally, folks, if you uh, if you miss this, 
just a couple of short days ago, Frederick and I got together in his secret lair and we discussed the future of TWIP, This Week in Photo Podcast. If you haven't seen it, we'll link to that up here. Make sure you get a chance to watch that. It was a fun interview and we all get to find out where Frederick has been, sort of. He's very secretive, this guy. Anyway, Frederick says, uh, in your opinion, does Final Cut Pro 10 color tools match or surpass Adobe Premiere's? Mm, that's a good question. I thought you were gonna ask about Resolve. So I don't, I've never actually cut in Premiere. My editor uses Premiere primarily. And um, I think that previous to this, Premiere's color grading tools were superior. I don't think that was even a question. They were superior. Now, however, I don't know. Final Cut Pro 10.4's, 10, Final Cut Pro 10, 10.4, it's too many 10s in here. Color grading tools are pretty wicked cool. How they compare though, I don't know. I don't, I, sorry, I don't have an answer for that, but I will tell you that where you used to have to add third-party plugins to do really effective color work, um, I don't think you can have to do that anymore in Final Cut 10, 10, 4. This is pretty pretty sweet. Um, Hit a record says, it was great to see you on the channel the other day. Excellent. So let's uh, let's go into, let's actually get this set up here first. Get the right system. Where to go? Get the right page up. There it is. And let's start by, let's start with the HEVC stuff just so I don't forget because I have a feeling I'm going to forget this if I don't. So here's what we have got. All right, these video files here, these are little videos of my little toddler running around like a wild monkey. And um, these are shot in 6K photo mode on the GH5. If you had tried to bring these in previously, they just, they wouldn't load. You'd get a not supported thing. If I go, I haven't even looked. If I go into the inspector here, does it tell me anything relevant about it being HEVC? Yeah, here we go. Codex, AAC, that is for your audio and HEVC high efficiency video codec. You can see the frame size, 5184 by 3456. This is that 6K photo format. It's shot in a 4.3 aspect ratio. And if I add this to a timeline, this is kind of cool. Let me, I'm just going to start all over again. We're going to go H26, H, H2652. Uh, this is my, I'm creating a new project. Okay, and as you probably know in Final Cut when you create a new project, it by default, you can create, you can tell it to be what format you want, but by default, it's kind of an empty shell. And the first clip that you drop onto the timeline, then Final Cut goes, oh, this is UHD 2398, uh, Rec 709, I'll set the format for that. Or you can change it manually if you want to. So for example, if you want a 1080p timeline and you're dropping UHD footage onto it, then you create it manually, drop it on and away you go. This is gonna be interesting what happens here when I drag this HEVC file on there. So I'm gonna take one of these video files, just grab uh, whatever, just grab this one here, and I drag that on and it pops up and it says, the video properties of this clip are not standard. So to set the project properties based on the clip, choose custom from the format pop-up menu. And that's, that's this right here. And, and you'll see what happens when I do that in a moment. To set project properties based on another clip, kip, click cancel and add the clip to the timeline. So that's basically saying that you can automatically set this up to support a, another type of media. And the easiest way to do that is just hit cancel, drag that other media on first, that will define the timeline and then add your non-standard stuff. Or if you know the format, you can just punch it in here by hand. So back to this, if I was to leave it where it is, we'd get this 4K at 4096, but that's not what I want. Um, I wanna do something that is native to this format. So if I go to custom, notice that it automatically, do you see how it updated there? It started 1920 by 1080, but then it switched over and it's now showing the actual resolution of this clip. So it is still sensing that, it's still pulling the data out of that file and dropping it into the timeline which is great. So it doesn't automatically do it. It's one more click and then you've got that in there. Of course, most people aren't gonna edit their video this way, but if you are doing this because you want to extract stills, then this is a perfectly normal way to do it, perfectly good way to do it. So I just hit okay at this point and now I've got a video file that is um, that is HEVC and is on a canvas that is 4.3 that matches it. So you can see here as I hit play, you see it start to chunk out. Again, this Mac is definitely a bit on the older side, um, but <laughs> we're, you're looking at a 1920 by 1080 broadcast right now. Look at we're looking at this thing at 15%. That's, that's like crazy. Um, so if I wanted to put this onto a standard UHD timeline, so let's create a new one and I'll go H265, H365, ooh, look, we're getting ahead of ourselves. H265 on um, UHD two, because I did this earlier, hit okay. And now this time I'm gonna go ahead and go into my settings file for this. And I'm gonna say, you know what? We're gonna make this thing 4K, standard UHD 3840 uh, by 2160, and this is gonna be 2997. 
and hit OK on there. And now when I drop this in, it's going to automatically scale that. You'll notice here it's got the black bars on the sides. That's just how it default comes in. But I can go in there and I can say, no, no, don't do fit, do a fill. And now I've got that. So I've just cropped the top and bottom of that footage off. So you can take any video that you've shot in your 6K photo mode in HEVC and drop it in now into any other project, which is, is fantastic, right? It's, it's always been one of the big things, the big selling points about Final Cut Pro 10. And I think pretty much all NLEs do this now, but when it first came out, this was kind of awesome. You could take anything and just throw it on the timeline. Actually, even was it Final Cut 7 even did that. I think so. It's been a while. We could take anything you want and throw it on the timeline, and it just worked. If it didn't match the format, it just rendered and played, usually in real time. We're getting that here, of course, now using the latest HEVC codex, even stuff that's not coming off of your phone, but coming off of a camera like the GH5. So awesome on that. Okay. Uh, let's go back to, so that, that's, I just wanted to show that there. So that, that's the biggie thing in there with the uh, HEVC. So that's enough. All right, let's get into the fun color stuff. I'm going to, so I, as you know, was just on a trip and I have been doing some very basic editing. I haven't gotten very far, as you can see, very, not very far at all on my project. But here's the fun thing. I shot the majority of the content for, on this trip as my vlog, which I'm really bad at vlogging. You know what I can't do? The talking to camera walking through the airport. I just, I just, I talk to this camera all day long, but put me like walking through the airport. I just, I can't do it. I don't know. I guess I got to better, get better at that. That's, that seems to be popular. There's that Casey guy that does that and people like his videos. So um, anyway, but I did shoot a lot of just kind of behind the scenes, B-roll type stuff. And I shot it almost entirely in vlog and almost entirely in vlog 10 bit. Some of it I shot 8 bit because I wanted 60p, but I shot most of it 10 bit. Vlog, so I could you know edit it with this new tool, which is great. Which is I didn't know it was coming out yesterday, so I'm really glad that it did. Great timing, Apple. Thank you very much. So I've got shots on here that are. Uh, let's get to the right part of the timeline here. Uh, let's see here. We're going to start with that's a bad shot here. I already pulled up a shot here. There's the one we're going to do. We're going to use this shot here, and let me just kind of clean things up a little bit. So this is the uh, Motor Speedway Hall of Fame, by the way. Look at that. That was I was so cool. I shot. I flew the drone over this thing. Um, probably would have gotten in trouble if I'd been seen, but I got away with it, which is awesome. And, and there's there obviously not a race going on. And uh, this is, as you can quite clearly see, very, very flat. This is a vlog file. Now, there's two different places that you can add a LUT to your project. What the is a LUT? I heard, I heard you guys say that. LUT stands for lookup table. A lookup table is essentially a, a, a spreadsheet, almost, if you will, just a grid of data points saying this color, this value exists on the video footage, make it look like this value. And it is a table of every possible value in the in the footage saying, make this look like this, make this look like this, make this look like this, and so on. And so that means that you take your flat or whatever look files. It could be, well, it could be starting with a flat file like this uh, log file. It could be starting with any regular footage. And you can apply a LUT to easily apply a look. This is a common thing you can actually buy or just download for free, but you can buy LUTs all over the place. Lots of cinematographers make them and, and they've come up with their kind of, this is my favorite look. And they might save their own custom look as a LUT that they reuse, but then they sell them because, hey, everybody likes like Peter McKinnon, for example. Brilliant editor, does just amazing stuff, looks super cinema, uh, cin cinematographic, cin you know what I mean. It looks beautiful. And he has a series of LUTs that he sells, which I've actually purchased because they're fantastic. And this gives you, a, at minimum, a starting point for your color grade. So there's two different ways to look at LUTs. There's the, col the special effecty, we'll call it special effectiveness, but the look, like custom look way. There's that LUT. And then there's the LUT that takes you from a log file like we've shot here, this very flat log file, and taking you into a standard color space like Rec. 709. So it just looks normal. Because as you can clearly see here, this shot looks super flat. If we bring up the scopes on here, you can see it's super flat, right? We're going from, um, look, our lowest is about 16 IRE up to even our peaks are barely at 70. The majority of it's around 64. So this really needs to be stretched out. So I could go into a video editor, a uh, color grader, and stretch this out. Or what I could do is apply a basic LUT profile. Final Cut Pro 10 comes with a series of LUT files. I don't know how many are missing, <laughs> it's got the one that I need. So let me show you first how to apply this kind of baseline LUT, and then we're gonna look at the corrective, uh, the, the creative ones because that is actually a separate application, which is really quite handy, honestly. So this clip is selected, it's it's already in the timeline, it could be in the, um, 
in the media browser, that's fine. And up here in the inspector, I click on the little I, open this guy up, and that opens up our little metadata panel. And if you look here, by default, it's going to be on basic, which uh, doesn't actually show the LUT. You have to switch this over to general, or I think extended has it as well. Or you can, of course, build your own profile if you wanted to, uh, your own metadata set. The key is we are looking for, here, right here, camera LUT. Here we go in there. Um, this says GH5 because I typed that in. It didn't pull that metadata over automatically, unfortunately. But um, here, camera LUT is currently set to none. If I click on that, you'll see there's a series of built-in LUTs. I've got Canon Log, Blackmagic cameras, and here's Panasonic V-Log. Now, to be fair, Panasonic V-Log is different than V-Log L or V-Log Lite, which is in the GH5. But I think it's going to be close enough. Um, I don't know, so don't yell at me if I'm wrong here, but I don't think that there's enough of a difference to warrant having to get a different log file for this, a uh, LUT file for this. It's going to be different enough. The difference incidentally between V-Log and V-Log L is the cameras, the Panasonic Vericams that shoot log, true V-Log, uh, V for Vericam, V-Log. Those cameras have higher dynamic range than the GH5. We're talking, you know, big 20, 30, 40, $50,000 cameras here, the big, big stuff. So what's on your GH5 is V-Log L, V-Log Lite, that is designed for the uh, less dynamic range that you have in the GH5 versus the significantly more expensive big cameras. Good, good. Okay, so we're going to set this to Panasonic VLOG and watch the video on the left-hand side of the screen as soon as I select it, how it suddenly becomes essentially normal, right? The video now looks normal. It's all stretched out. Um, it looks like a normal video. So this allows me to very quickly go from my flat log file up to something that looks normal. From there, now I might want to, now I'm going to get creative, right? Now I'm going to go in and I can cool down my shadows or uh, play with the highlights or maybe stretch out the exposure even more or do some corrective exposure, exposure correction if I need to, if I overexpose the shot or there's details that are way out there and that's why I shot in 10 bits so I could pull down some of the highlight details. All of that stuff I do after this, but applying this basic LUT allows me to look at my stuff on the timeline looking normal, which is really nice because it's kind of annoying to edit without a look applied. It's just kind of annoying. So this allows you to do that. Now you can at this stage apply a custom LUT as well. So let's just say that you are high-end editor and you've got a, a production company, a DP handing you the footage and they have created their own look. On set, they were monitoring with this look. The director has decided this, whatever. You've got a team and they have created this look and that is the base point. That is the starting point that they want you, the editor, to use. They can provide that LUT file. You drop that in here. And of course, you can select all your clips and add it on all at once. And now you've got that look, that baseline look. And that might already have some creative effect to it. That's just, that's what they the editor, the director, DP, and so on decided on. From there, you can get creative and do your own thing. Well, obviously, it depends on what you're allowed to do for your job, but um, but that's the idea there. So you got your, your essential base version that's either a camera stock type of a look, taking you up to your standard Rec. 709 type of a look, or you've got something that your uh, director, DP, whatever, has given you saying, start from here. So that is where that gets applied. And then we get creative. So I've got this shot that now looks normal. And I'm going to go back over to my regular editing here, and I can go down and add the new Apple LUT effect. So I'm going to look at the video effects here. So if we let me zoom into this a little bit. So we're looking at the effects in here. I'm looking at all video effects. I don't know where the heck that LUT is in here, so I'm going to do a quick little search. I go in here and I type in LUT, and it has two things. Custom LUT, which is the one that comes from Apple, and Apply LUT, which is actually a plugin that I had previously purchased so that I could apply LUTs in Final Cut prior to this version. I'm not going to delete that because if I open up an older project that used that plugin, it sure would suck if suddenly that look that I had done then went away. <clears throat> now, that may not, it may actually kind of be baked in enough that it doesn't matter, but I'm not going to risk it. It's not crashing it or anything. I'm just going to leave it there. It's fine. It is what it is. But you no longer need to have a third party plugin because you have one built in, this effect built in. So let's take a look at how that works. So I would take this custom LUT, drag it onto the clip, and at first nothing's going to happen to the clip. It doesn't change. But here is the new effect that was just added, this custom LUT. And you can see in here, there's a bunch of stuff in here. And these are many of the third party ones that I have already. Uh, that I had previously purchased that I have now installed. So Leaming LUT, incidentally, great company, great place to learn how to shoot in log and to get some good baseline LUTs from them. Here's my Peter McKinnon LUTs. So I'm going to choose one of his. Let's do, um, you know, Arctic Circle. All right. So I apply this and there's the look that it applies. So that is Peter McKinnon's Arctic Circle LUT look. And incidentally, I'll, I'll make sure we link down below to Peter's uh, page for these. I think they're only $15 for, uh, for his LUT pack. It's pretty sweet. Pretty good deal. 
Um, so that's in there, and then I can mix it, right? I can say, you know, it's a bit too much. Let's just kind of scale that back a little bit and just pull that back and get a little bit of his look in there. Or let's try another look. Let's just try different things. Um, I have no idea what any of these are going to look like, so we'll just try some, let's try some more of his. Do Peter McKinnon fade out. Let's take the uh, intensity all the way back up. It's funny, that actually almost makes it look back to the original log look on there. Uh, let's try another one in here. He's got this teal and orange. Yeah, that teal and orange, though, it's called. There you go, teal and orange. So that's our teal and the highlights. Orange in the shadows. Is that right? It was the other way around. Uh, and you can see it's kind of applied that look. We can scale that back a little bit. So, all right. So that's cool. So we're looking at this. We can apply our basic look in here. But looking at our waveform in here, you can see that it, we still have not stretched out the full range of this shot. So let's let's get rid of the custom LUT and go back to our, just our basic default look here with the generic Panasonic LUT applied. And now we're going to play with the fun tools. Now we get into the new color grading tools that are in Final Cut Pro 10 version 10.4, and this is this is the cool stuff. Uh, Daddy MCC saying good morning over there. Uh, let's just do a quick little stop over here and see what's going on in the comments before we continue on. Um, uh, interesting, uh, interesting handle there, Mr. That's a load of crap. Uh, says, loves 10.4. Why do I waste hundreds on plugins? Well, because 10.4 just came out and you've been editing for years. That's why. Uh, your investment was worth it. In the, in the beginning. Trevor says, I switched over to Final Cut Pro 10 from PP, Premiere, Premiere Pro. Ah, there we go. Three years ago and haven't looked back. Faster cutting in Final Cut 10. Yeah, okay, let's let's not get into that religious war, but um, there's fundamental differences between how you edit in Final Cut versus Premiere. And I personally have gotten used to the Final Cut way and I love it. Going to an editor like Premiere feels kind of old fashioned to me. But obviously, they have some great tool. It's a fantastic editor. There's no, or it's great. If you're a Premiere user, fantastic. If you're a Resolve user, fantastic. If you're a Final Cut user, fantastic. Don't really care as long as you're using a tool that you like. That is what matters. Uh, Christopher's having trouble starting and stopping the video. Just refresh the feed, Christopher. Um, I don't think uh, I think everything's good on this end. Okay, let's get back to the back to the fun stuff. Let's go back to this. All right, so now we're going to apply some color. Now, those of you who've been using Final Cut may recall that to apply a color look, you had to first actually apply the color. It was option E where you could pull the menu and pull color. Now there's a dedicated button that's just, essentially the color is just there and waiting for you. So I just go over to here to this dedicated new little button, which um, this funky little triangle thing is kind of like there. That's, that's the, I don't know where these things come from, but that's the color tool. So I click on that. And we start off with, we're going to start off with a basic color board. Now, incidentally, uh, I haven't even looked at this yet, but apparently in the preferences, command common to bring up the preferences, here we go. You can choose a default correction, what is added by default. Color board, color wheels, color curves, or hue saturation curves. Color board is the old way and all the rest are the new ways. So that's kind of cool. So let's, uh, we're just going to leave it as it is. Actually, yeah, we'll leave it as it is. Uh, let's just take a look at what we got. So we go into, um, did I do anything? Did I add? Okay, here's our basic color tool. And if I start dragging this, it Im immediately adds that color board. See, so now it just says color board. So it's automatically added that correction to it just because I touched it and started playing with it. So in this case, let me reset this. I would go to exposure and look at my shadows. I'm way above zero. My highlights are way below 100. So I might stretch this out a little bit. I do a little stretch out there. Let's keep it above zero, keep it below 100, keep it with any other than the peaks and the highlights. We're okay with that. And there's our basic, simple little color grade. And you know now you go, wow, that's a big difference in there, right? It looks really good. Okay, cool. But that was kind of limited, right? This, this, and then you had saturation and this color tool. I mean, I got to be honest here. A, getting a, a look with this was like, forget it. I just, I, can I be honest here for a second? I hated this color tool. It just was so limiting, so limiting. <laughs> but that's all changed now. So I'm going to just uh, risk get rid of this guy here. Let's delete that correction. And now let's take a look at the new corrections. Color wheels, super standard way to do color grading in here. If I, let's see, can I make this a little bigger? I'm not even sure. Uh, can I make that a little, it wants to move. There we go. Make that a little bigger. No, those don't really grow, do they? Maybe if I go this way, make it a little bigger. Eh, they don't grow. Oh, I can do one at a time. So I can do this and view them in single wheel mode. So if I want to have a bigger one there, but it's not that much bigger, is it? So I'll just look at all wheels. So you've got your master. I can push the entire color scheme up towards orange or towards magenta or towards blue, towards green, towards yellow, whatever. I have that full master control in there along with, and this is pretty cool. Let's zoom into this a little bit. This nice little interface here. You have your color wheel on there. You can tell what color you've picked 
because of how the saturation slider changes. So yes, that is a saturation slider. You can see on the left, the color saturation changing. And then over here is a basic brightness slider. So you know, we said, adjust the brightness level. So you can adjust the brightness of the overall image. So let's zoom out on that. So you can do a basic, and you can see how it's not stretching it, right? It's just taking the entire thing and shifting it up or down in there. So now you can do that individually for your shadows, highlights, and midtones. So I can say, oh, let's cool down my shadows a little bit, add a little bit of cool in there. Let's warm up my highlights a little bit warm the highs in there, uh, maybe take some saturation up on the highlights, but let's desaturate the shadows. And you can do all of this so quickly and easily. You have color temperature controls, you have tint controls, um, and then you can get into linear, linear, I don't know, just slider controls for all of these as well, if for some reason you prefer to work that way. And then this mix, this kind of master mix, let's just take everything I've done and dial it back a bit, which is really, really nice. So these color wheels here are so cool. That is awesome sauce. So let me delete that and go to the next one. Now you can, incidentally, I'm deleting and adding new ones just so you can clearly see the differences, but you can absolutely combine these in any way that you want. Also, what you can do in here, it's not new, so I'm not going to show it right now, but you can mask all of your color tools. You can mask them based off of shape or based off of color sample. So you can, for example, quite easily select the color of the skin tone and then saturate or desaturate just the skin tones, for example, in the scene. All stuff, you've been able to do that before, but now you can do that with any of these other tools. Okay, so let's go to curves next. As I said, I am a huge fan of curves, and we have here a Luma red, green, and blue curve on there. I love this. So I'm going to go in and do a standard S curve. Let's pull my shadows down, pump the highlights up. You can see what's happening to the histo, uh, to the waveform over here on the left. And I've just nicely stretched that out like so. If I wanted to uh, let's pull a little bit of red out of the shadows, I could do it that way. Let's just add another control point in there, pull some of those reds out of the shadows. Maybe I want to make the highlights really cool. So I'll go here, add a point to make the highlights a bit cooler. And you can totally customize your look this way. It's fun to see, actually, here, let me do this. Let me switch this over to a, um, what am I looking for? Is it the, no, not the RGB parade. Uh, no, actually, yeah, that is what I want, the RGB parade, because then as I do the red, you can see how the red is the predominant one that's changing. Obviously, we're still gonna get some overlap into the R red, uh, excuse me, into the green and blue channels, but you can see that that is predominantly what's changing in there. I happen to quite like this view in here. Oh, not that view, what am I doing? Waveform in RGB overlay, where all the channels are laid on top of each other. I quite like this view, but you know, that's me, whatever works for you. If I do this, it's kind of cool. You can see here how you've got this much cooler data in the shadows because I lifted up the reds, revealing the blues down there. All kinds of fun stuff you can do. Okay, so there's curves, absolutely fantastic. And then let's delete that one and add the last one here, which is these hue saturation curves. This is super powerful. This allows you to, you'll see here, it's like, well, let me zoom in here real close. You can kind of read it in the corner there. It says here like hue versus saturation. So you've got hue on one side, saturation on the other. So you pick where the hue is and then you adjust the saturation as you want. Make sense? This is crazy cool. Watch what we can do. All right. I'm going to do, let's do hue versus saturation. Let's say that I wanted to saturate the blue in here. Well, I can kind of guess at where the blue is and add some control points to hold things, right? If I, if I don't do that and I adjust the slider, then everything's going to move. So I'm going to do that and just adjust the blue. So I can saturate the blues or desaturate the blues. See what's happening in the sky in there? So cool. Or watch this. Let me just reset that, grab the eyedropper and say blue. And it automatically adds the point. It adds anchor points. And now I can saturate or desaturate that shade of blue. Let's, uh, can we actually, let me try this. Can I add multiple points? Let's try the red. Yeah, add the red as, red as well. You can see how it's it's a wraparound. It's a 360 degree uh, color wheel, of course, expressed linearly. So now I've brought up the red on that as well. Pretty cool, right? So that is so cool. So you can do the same thing with Luma. So I can say, all right, my blue sky is nicely saturated, but I want it to be darker. So let's grab the eyedropper, click on that blue sky again, and then take the luminance of that blue sky down like so. I can change saturation based off the luminance, saturation based off saturation. And what was at the top? Hue versus hue. So you have total control over this thing. It is so crazy cool. This is awesome. You really have an intense amount of control over the colors in here, which is great. It's really, really powerful to see this stuff now in Final Cut. To go back in time a little bit, back when I was still at Apple, um, Apple acquired the app color, what was the name of the company? Oh boy, I forget now. Um, anyway, this app called Color. It was this incredible color grading tool. This is where I cut my teeth on coloring. I learned how to grade. It was this insanely awesome tool. And then Final Cut 
10 came out. This is back when Final Cut 7 days. Then Final Cut Pro 10 came out, X, 10, X came out, and all those tools were gone. And it's taken, what, six years to get this stuff back? So I'm... I'm really happy to see that. I am super happy to see that. Trevor saying, Hue versus Luminous is probably the most powerful tool in there. You could only do that Resolve before. Don't know how well it works yet. I need to test it more. Awesome. Um, uh, Trevor's also saying, the old color panel was incredibly imprecise. I always use the color finale plugin. Yeah, the old color panel, color panel sucked. This is, this is huge. So there's that. So that is super awesome. Okay, um, that's the color stuff that I want to show you. There was the white balance. I want to show you that as well. So even though I don't have a... I think I have a shot in here that needs white balance correction, but um, I don't know. Maybe let's just pretend this shot needs white balance correction. So here's how this works. You select the shot. It's a little odd because I don't think if – actually, I haven't even tried this yet. If I search white – yeah, see, there's nothing that shows up under white. You have to go to this little uh, magic wand-looking menu here. I honestly do not like that icon, but there you go. And I choose balance color. So I choose balance, and it doesn't auto balance. And it changed a little bit. You might see that it changed a little bit. But the key is, under here, there's our balance color. Method, auto, so it's an auto. But now you can switch that over to white balance. And now with white balance, I can grab the eyedropper. It's automatically selected. And you'll see over here, it also says to set the white balance... To set the white balance, click and drag over an area that should be pure white. So obviously, this is not going to be accurate. But if I go over here, and let's kind of let zoom into this. Let's go in to 100% on this shot. And let's just pretend that that's supposed to be white. I click on that, which is fairly neutral enough. And uh, and there we go. So now I've just done a little white balance control, which actually, it's actually really good, isn't it? Because I was a little bit, now this is warm because it was morning light. So it was naturally warm light, which I actually want. But if I wanted to make it look more like um, a kind of high sun neutral light, uh, then there you go. I've just done that. So that's how you do the white balance. It's a little bit odd, I think, but uh, but it's it's there. So there is that. All right, let's see. I feel like I've forgotten something. Um, let me see here. Where were we? Uh, Safari, that's what I want. Let's see here. Um, color tab, dedicated color tab. We looked at that. New color wheels, we looked at that. Curves, hue saturation, eyedropper, and color hue saturation curve. We looked at that. Balance color commands, white balance, did that. Lots, we did that. Color correction over time. We talked about it. We're not going to show it now, but it's, it's keyframing for the color. Um, keyboard shortcuts, I just don't know them yet. And, oh, color presets. Yeah, let's look at the color presets. So let's take a look at that. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and reset this. And let me make this a little bit better sized here. And let's see here. Color presets. There we go. Let's reset my search. So you have this color presets, and you can see them all in here. Honestly, I don't know if any of these are new or not, but um, I don't know. Let's do like a, it was a day to night that I think was reasonably effective. Uh, where was that? Oh, I must have skipped past it. Dim, do, well, does contrast brightness. Did you, where's day to night? I'm sure it was in there. Maybe it was just the one that's called night. Moonlight? I don't know. Let's just drag that on. Moonlight. That, okay, kind of, sort of looks like moonlight. Sure, why not? I'll believe it. Um, anyway, and then you can go up. So you add those different color effects. You add them in, and then you've got your um, color board. Is this where it is? I don't even remember this. Oh, right. Okay. So it is, eh, okay. That makes sense. So it's added a color board that has these changes made to it. So this is effectively a preset of this. So you can add it and then kind of break it down and look at it and make tweaks to it, makes adjustments to it if you want to. So that's how that works. That is everything that I wanted to show you guys today. I'm so excited about all this. Let's see what else is going on in the comments in here. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, Daddy MCC says, would you say that the 10.4 update is a game changer for Final Cut? I would say it is. Oh, here to record says that the day and tonight is under the looks. Okay. So looks are different than the color presets, right? Very important. So maybe all these color presets are in fact new. I don't know. I'd have to look back at the old one. Anyways, you got looks and you got color presets. Color presets being that they are actually changing the color using the existing color tools so that you can go in and manipulate that as your little heart desires. So thank you very much here to record. Um, yeah, Daddy MCC, I think it really is a game changer. This is this is huge. This is a major, major upgrade. I saw written somewhere that this is the most significant upgrade since it first came out. Um, I don't know if that's true, but it is definitely a big one. Um, yeah, I guess that's about that. So if you got any other questions, you know what to do. Stick them up here in the comments real quick. Like if you uh, don't get a chance to ask it here, ask it in the show later on and uh, in the comments down below once that's opened up and you'll be able to see that. I think... We're going to wrap it up right there. I am, as you have undoubtedly figured out, quite excited about this. I think it's fantastic. Remember, we'll link to the look to the LUTs down below. Um, I'll put a link down to the Leaming LUT website. 
as well as to the Peter McKinnon presets because I quite like those. You can uh, you know go grab those if you want. Um, Leaming LUT is a great resource even just to learn on how to shoot log, how to expose for log, and so on. All of which I applied when I was shooting this stuff. So once I get around to actually editing this and finishing it, uh, hopefully it'll turn out awesome and you'll be able to see what I did. All right, folks, that is it. We are out of here. Take care of yourselves. It was great to see you today. And ooh, Monday. Okay, real quick, sorry. Um, holiday schedule. I gotta talk to Ryan. I don't remember. I was gonna take all of next week off. I still am gonna take most of it off, but I'm probably gonna come in in the morning because my kids tend to sleep till noon, so may as well come in. So I'm, I think we're gonna do a show Monday, Wednesday, Friday of next week. Uh, definitely Monday, Wednesday. I think Ryan's here. I'm not sure. Gotta find out. And then the week between Christmas and New Year, nada. We're shutting down during that week. I am going to, we are going to be rebuilding the studio in that time. So, yeah. Anyway, so that's what's happening there. I was going to, yeah, anyway, that's, so that's the plan. We'll see what happens. Um, and Ryan says you're here. Excellent. So I guess we're doing the show. Super. All right, guys. Thanks a bunch. We'll see. Siri woke up at some point and started dictating my entire show. Helpful. See you next time, guys. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>